If you feel like getting your toes and feet amputated later in life and just sounds like fun to you, then you should definitely avoid looking at and controlling your blood sugar levels because that's diabetes. Um, but here are the practical steps to prevent that. Exercise, lift weights two, to two times per week, get cardio in two to three times a week, more is better. Do exercise that you enjoy, and it doesn't have to be super high intensity or for hours at a time. It could be as simple as going for a brisk walk for 20 to 30 minutes a day where you get your heart rate up. If you can't do 20 minutes, start with five minutes. Anything is better than zero. And here is a motto of mine for exercise, never zero. Unless I have the flu, then it's never zero. If it's too cold outside, get a cheap treadmill that folds up. If you don't have a lot of space in your house, that works really well. Um, I'm going to be creating a different video about kind of the minimal dosage of exercise that would be helpful in building the routine. And I'll put that in the, um, the comments. But uh, also a low-carb diet, less than 400 to 600 calories per day from carbs helps. Uh, this helps to reduce and reverse prediabetes and the need for insulin um, as the amount of glucose being injected into the system is significantly reduced. You can also talk with your doctor about taking the medication metformin. It's a drug used to treat diabetes and also to prevent or delay type 2 diabetes with people who have prediabetes. Um, now I'm briefly going to go through the how of each step here. In the future, I'll create more videos that go through more in-depth through each step. So step one is resistance training. If you can, get a gym membership or get some adjustable dumbbells for your house. Uh, if you don't have cash for either of those, you can get some resistance training bands for less than 20 bucks on Amazon. And if you still can't get that, you can do bodyweight workouts. Um, and I have other videos I can, I can put in the description below too. Um, so I digress. That's, uh, that's for another time. But um, so step, the next step is once you have your equipment or gym membership or no equipment, search on YouTube. 10 minutes beginner weightlifting workout or 10 minute beginner resistance band workout or 10 minute beginner calisthenic workout. Calisthenics um, are bodyweight resistance training exercises like push-ups, squats, and there's an endless complexity you could add to that, but complexity really fails when you're first starting out. So if you're just getting back into lifting, then take it slow. You can't go right back into the intensity you were doing before uh, without either number one, burning yourself out, or number two, injuring yourself. So next one's cardio. Like I shared before, this could be as simple as going for a brisk walk. You know, too cold, too hot, not enough time, not enough energy, I don't know where to start. Those are some of the most common excuses. Um, too cold or too hot, get a gym membership where there is temperature control. Get a treadmill for your house or apartment. They're really like some tiny foldable ones that cost less than 200. If you don't have enough time, start with five minutes. If you can't do five minutes, do one minute. Everyone has one minute. <laughs> if you don't have enough energy, not enough energy, sitting around most of the day or being physically inactive reduces energy levels too and your level of alertness. So it's likely moderate intensity exercise will actually boost your energy levels. And if you have chronic fatigue syndrome, you can still benefit from smaller and lower intensity bouts of exercise and or weight training and increase your capacity over time. Uh, choose exercise or physical activity you enjoy. Uh, if you don't enjoy any, you either aren't doing it right or you haven't tried nearly enough types. There are literally dozens of different types of physical activity, so keep trying till you find a new one that you jive with. Uh, next thing that you can do is uh, go on a low-carb diet. So if you eat a ton of refined carbs, like I do when I'm working on reducing this, then you're likely on a very high-carb diet. So I try to supplement refined carbs like bread with sweet potatoes, a higher percentage of monounsaturated fats like pistachios and other nuts, and just a higher percentage of protein. So if I'm going to have more refined carbs, I'll try to have something that is whole wheat. Uh, all you nutrition experts can debate in the comments why that's good or bad for me. Um, but having a high-carb diet isn't a problem in itself if you are utilizing a, ma a majority of those for fuel, like when you're a cross-country runner or a wrestler or a swimmer, uh, you can get away with this. But this becomes a problem when your physical activity levels drop significantly, which they invariably will once you get past your 20s for, for most people, or you'll at least have seasons where you're not as active. So uh, going to the medications, metformin is a medication often given to pre-diabetics and diabetics. In pre-diabetics, it can prevent or delay the onset 
to full-blown diabetes. In diabetics, it can help you better regulate your blood sugar, and it's a powerful drug best combined with exercise and diet. So we've covered a lot, the, the how, and there's a lot more just in detail. And if you have questions, just comment below and I'll make future videos on it. Um, now I just wanted to jump into the what a little bit in case you aren't sure what prediabetes is and why it's a problem. So prediabetes is like the fuel light on your car. Diabetes is when your tank is already empty. Uh, if fuel light comes on, you go get gas, lest you become stranded in the rain. Diabetes happens like this. It's kind of like how when you were in your 20s and you were a normal, healthy body weight, and then all of a sudden you started working full time, you had kids, and it's 10 or 20 years later, and now you're 50 or 100 pounds overweight. And these things, they happen slowly over time and then kind of all at once. So... If your A1C is already between 5.7 to 6.4%, or your blood glucose, aka blood sugar, is between 100 to 125, you're already on your way to full-blown diabetes. Those numbers I just shared are the pre-diabetes levels. So depending on the study you read, between 30 to 70% of people who have pre-diabetes will develop diabetes. That means that if you had 100 people in a room, between 30 and 70 of those folks are going to develop diabetes. Of those, let's say 50 people, once they develop diabetes, um, they're unfortunately going to die much sooner than someone without diabetes. If you get diagnosed with diabetes at age 30 or 40, on average, you're going to die 14 to 10 years earlier. Uh, this was according to a study out of Cambridge. So why is this? I mean, what, what's the problem with the little extra sugary goodness in the arteries? Well, to name a few, a uh, higher incidence of cancer and heart attack and stroke and Alzheimer's, among other bad things, and amputations. I work with people every day who've had amputations due to uncontrolled blood sugar. It's a mess. Um, all right, so you know prediabetes pre is bad, but there is hope in reversing it. We went over a few of those, um, and some are just easier to address than others. So let's kind of review and look at what those action steps are those action steps are. Um, and here's a super simple way to do that. Um, I'm going to use exercise and as an example, and you can use the same formula for the other aspects. So number one, make it easy. Uh, we talked about this before. Choose a duration and type of exercise that seems so easy, you're embarrassed to say how little you're doing. For example, I walked on the treadmill for five minutes yesterday. Seems like nothing, but you have to develop your consistency muscle before you can make any meaningful lifestyle changes. Um, number two is integrate it with an existing routine. So here's my exercise integration right now. Since I currently have two kids under two, there's truly just isn't much time for any extracurriculars, let alone taking care of myself. So I have a few 10 to 20 minutes uh, workouts that I'll pump out like three to four times a week, more if I'm able to. Uh, first, when I get home from work, I immediately change out of my scrubs, into my workout clothes. Then about two hours later, I put my daughter down for bed around 7 to 7.30 p.m. and immediately go into my garage to get a workout in. And yes, I have a garage gym, so it's very convenient, but you can also do this if you have a yoga mat somewhere in your house. Um, all you need is a corner somewhere in your house or apartment. Um, so as you can see, I did a few things there. I chose a duration of exercise that I knew I could do, I put on exercise clothes when I got home, which primed me to be ready for exercise later in the night. And then I started exercising right after completing another task. This sequence of events makes it much easier to complete. Um, some people will do it after they brush their teeth, after they finish dinner, right when they get home from work, etc. I mean, it, it really depends on kind of what your schedule looks like. If you can do it at the same time every day, that's where the magic of that consistency comes into play. Um, so really just best of luck to you. And if you want more videos expanding on how to get started and staying consistent on anything else that I covered um, in the video, please drop it in the comments below and I will add it to the list. Thanks and have a great day.